Welcome. I'm Janine Raymond, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Human Resources, and it's my pleasure to introduce the faculty who are kicking off Staff Appreciation Week this year. Each year, I ask the deans for a recommendation for someone who, whose work can connect with the theme for the week. And uh, this year, we had two people accept the invitation. And I, I think it will be an interesting spin on the theme, Mind, Body, and Soul, heard both from the perspective of an historian and a nutritional biochemist. So we'll get two different perspectives on the same theme. So first from the historian. Uh, Dr. Peterson, who is uh, also the chair of our history department, is a Harvard alum where he received both his undergraduate and graduate degrees before coming to Berkeley in 2007. And among the many honors and awards, and awards he's received, and they indeed have been many, he's an elected member of the American Antiquarian Society, the Massachusetts Historical Society, the Colonial Society of Massachusetts. He's the recipient of the Frederick Burkhard Residential Fellowship for recently tenured scholars. In 2002, he received the Woodrow Wilson Prize for best article on the reformed tradition in America. And while at the University of Iowa, he received the Faculty Scholar Award, I think several times. Uh, his interests range widely across political, religious, intellectual, economic, and cultural history. Among his current projects, nearing completion is The City State of Boston, A Tragedy in Three Acts, 1630 to 1865. And in the works, two collaborative projects, one on Boston and Kingston, Jamaica across the 18th century, and one on Anglo-Delch colonial expansion, 1560 to 1652. A future project will focus on religious reform, the construction of desire and demand in early modern Anglo-America. Today's topic, why do we want what we want? A historian's perspective. Dr. Peterson. All right. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you very much, Janine, for that nice introduction and to that mysterious audience watching on the web, on wherever it is that you might be watching, welcome to. Do I need to worry about this microphone? No, okay. I'm just gonna move it away then. All right, well, uh, Janine mentioned uh, a future project that I'm going to work on, and that actually is the subject of what I wanted to talk about today. Um, I thought this mind, body, soul theme was very interesting for this week. Um, and as soon as I heard that's what the theme was, I knew immediately what I wanted to address. Uh, it's the, the topic that I've put on the title here, but another way of thinking about it is that it's the problem of too much. So let me begin by putting a question to you, the audience, and those of you who are watching on the web can shout out answers as well, I just won't hear them. Um, the question is this, how many of you think that your life, your, the overall quality of your life would be better if only you possessed more things or how many of you think your life would be better if you owned fewer things? So I'm gonna ask them both. How many would be in the more things category? Your life would be better if you owned a lot more stuff. Okay, we got two, three, four, five. How about, uh, how many of you think your life would be better if you had fewer stuff? Okay, I think the fewer stuff wins by a little bit here. Um, and that was my expectation. But what it points to, is kind of an odd historical problem. That is, throughout everything that we know about human history, from the time that you have the earliest records of it, seven, eight, 10,000 years ago, if you were to ask that question to almost all people who ever lived, the vast majority of the answers would have been more stuff. And in fact, I think it's still the case on the planet today that of the seven billion, however many human beings there are, 
there's still an awful lot of people who would be in the more stuff camp, who lack adequate food supplies, who lack clean water, who lack adequate housing. I, I'm sure you know there are places in the world, especially in the global south, where significant populations live on glean from essentially the trash heaps of the global north, right? There are people in many places in the world today who do not have enough stuff. And yet, we also know that you know, we live in a society today in the United States that wastes, literally throws away mountains of food. You know, we live in a consumer society that produces more and more stuff all the time, many of it essentially planned to be obsolete before too long, right? As staff members, I'm sure you're well aware of the cycling through of the electronics of this university, right? I just had to order a new computer because the one I bought five years ago, which to me seems to work perfectly fine, is obsolete because I can't literally update it to the new operating systems that the university supports because if I did, it would crash. You know, the, the memory that I thought was fine five years ago that I bought is now utterly inadequate, right? It's this kind of continual production of stuff that demands the production of more stuff in order to, to keep it working. And, and this condition, living in a world where we have more things than we know what to do with, where our wants and desires seem to be growing and growing all the time, where in fact the very measure of whether our economy is healthy or not is whether the indicators are positive for growth, right? More, and growth means more stuff, right? That's kind of how we reckon our relative position in the world even. And so a historian looks at this and especially trying to take the, the long sweep of human history and says, well, this is odd. You know, this world where there are some people who live in a world of too much is the product of historical processes over time. The world wasn't always like this. And in fact, we can reasonably well pinpoint the beginning of this development to what historians refer to frequently as the early modern period the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, especially in Western Europe, including the British Isles, and the colonies that Western Europe was producing, especially in North America. In other words, those were the places where the events that historians refer to as the consumer revolution, the proliferation for things and the demand for more and more things really took off. Many of you are probably familiar with the phrase the Industrial Revolution. You know, that's been something that historians have been aware of for a long time. It's usually associated with the 18th and the 19th century, again, especially in Western Europe, in Great Britain, in the United States. This was the period when you start to have the rise of large scale mass automated manufacturing that has led to the world of proliferating textiles, of uh, metal industrial goods of all kinds, railroads, automobiles, transportation, and the like. But over the last couple of decades, historians working on the economic history of uh, the early modern period have come to notice an interesting thing that yes, the rise of factory production in the 18th and 19th century, the, the, the industrial world that we came to know and that predominated through the 20th century, yes, those were important in terms of production. But the interesting thing is that demand came first. And it actually kind of stands to reason because the creation of large scale industrial production, the great mills of Britain, the factories of places like Pittsburgh and Detroit and the like, those required really extensive forms of capital investment, right? Factories were not cheap to build, that is modern industrial factories. And so for it to be worth the risk of an industrialist to do, they had to know that the demand was there already, right? When the British 
uh, textile mills of the late 18th century started producing cotton and woolen cloth in larger numbers than anyone had ever seen before, what made it possible for them to do that was the knowledge that, yeah, there were consumers out there, there were customers, there was demand already. And so what I'm talk, gonna talk about today, to phrase it another way, is the rise of modern demand. Where did this come from? Where did the desire for more and more things on a scale not seen before, what was the origin of that? Why and how did human feelings human desires, the, the, the mind or the soul part of the acquisition of things. How and why did that change? And especially in the early modern period in Western Europe and in early North America. We know what happened. For instance, let me give you an example of how dramatic this was. One of the, the ways in which historians like me, and, and as Janine suggested, I've worked on colonial America and New England in particular for a long time. And this is one of the places where the exponential growth in demand and the takeoff of industry led the way of all the parts of the United States that become industrialized in the 19th century. It's New England and the area around Boston where it happens first. So there too, people were aware of this growing level of demand and that it could be met in new ways. So one of the ways that historians know about the kinds of material goods that people had in the past was by looking at the court records from the wills that people made when they died, right? Because part of the problem in knowing about the material conditions of the past is that most of it goes away, right? Not that much survives over the course of centuries. And the things that do survive uh, like stone monuments and the like, are not really very good reflectors of you know, the ordinary way in which people live. I mean, how many stone monuments do you have in your house really today? I mean, if you think about the things that you possess, clothing, food, um, uh, even houses themselves, time goes by and, and they disappear in one way or another. But wills, documents in which people described what they owned and how they were going to leave them to the next generation is one of the best ways we know about this. And this is where you can see it. It's really quite extraordinary. It's striking that if you look at, say, an average New England farm family and where the, the, the husband and father died and left a will behind, it's extraordinary how sparse their material conditions were, say, around six, 1650, in the middle of the first century of North American colonization. An average farm family, let's say a husband and wife and six children, they would probably only own one or two chairs. That is, when they sat down to dinner to eat their main meal of the day, there would not be chairs for everybody. The, mother, the father and maybe the mother would get to sit. The rest would pull up a barrel, a box, whatever. They might have uh, 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 you know, the, the table built in a way that there was a bench or something like that. But chairs were not for everybody. Beds were not for everybody. Again, the mother and father might have a bed. Everyone else, some straw would probably do. What would they eat off of on their table? Well, there might be wooden trenchers. That is, the, the, the father, the brothers might have taken pieces of wood and sort of carved and smoothed and scraped them out so that they would have something to eat off rather than just the table, but nothing that we would recognize as plates or china or that sort of thing. Did they have silverware? Probably not. The family might own a couple of cooking utensils, like a big spoon and a knife for cutting things up. Forks? No way that you're not gonna find them in the inventories of a, of a farming household in the 17th century. Decorations on the wall? No. Um, you flip ahead a century, right? And you look at not a, not a family that is far wealthier. That is, it could be the same kind of family living on the same amount of land, farming the same number of acres with the same number of children. But by 1750, there's an extraordinary transformation. At that point, it's hard to find a house where there isn't a chair, at least, for everybody. It's hard to find a house where there isn't dishes, china of some kind or another. Now, not necessarily the fanciest in the world, but imitations of fancy china of the sort that aristocrats lived off of. 
Silverware, yes. Artwork on the walls, maybe cheap reproductions of a print of the king or of a nobleman or of a famous battle or something like that. But you'd go in and you would see decorations on the walls. You would see beds for everybody, not beds that you would find comfortable today, but nonetheless, there, there's an extraordinary transformation in the stuff that people have over the course of the century. And I'm talking about New England here. Now the, the pattern might have been different. In the Netherlands, maybe a little earlier. In the American South, a little bit later. But all over Western Europe and in the growing parts of North America that become the United States, you see this transformation, this consumer revolution that, that people at the same level of social status are now having more and more stuff. And the interesting thing about it is this. When, again, uh, and I'm talking about a world where more than 90% of the people were farming people. Right? That is what uh, the major occupation of most everybody in the world was until modern times. Right? And the striking thing about this is that when, let's say, a farming family gained a little bit of extra income in the 17th century, in, say, that 1650 family, their tendency, and again, you can see this in wills that they leave behind, you can see it in, in, in commercial records of the time, their tendency was buy a little more land, buy a few more animals, increase the productive capacity of the farm. And by 1750, and even more so by the 1800s, that same kind of farming family gets a little more income, and what do they do now? Buy fancier stuff, buy more stuff more wet hangings for the wall, more beds, nicer beds, finer textiles, uh, making sure that everyone in the family now has a suit of Sunday clothes so that when you go to church, you can look better. You can look more refined. You can look more respectable than your ancestors a century before had done when they walked off to church in the same clothes that they had worn during their workday week as farmers, right? So there, there's a, a shift that's going on in what people want. And it's a dramatic one. And it's, and it's large enough so that we can trace this in the commercial records of shipping going back and forth across the ocean. Uh, we can trace it in the development of new kinds of businesses and industries across the 17th and 18th century, and particularly in these places. In other words, we know what happened, but we still kind of don't know why. We don't have a very good explanation for this takeoff of consumer demand and the proliferation of goods to meet this demand. And so for the rest of the time today, what I want to do is offer kind of a, a set of speculations on this. That is, this is something I've begun to work on, I've thought about for a long time, but I don't by any means pretend to have the answer. This is not nailed down. But it gives you a sense of how I and many of my fellow historians work where we are gripped by a historical problem and then we try to figure out how to approach it, what kinds of questions we can ask, how we can get into it in a way that will help to produce an answer. Now I draw a lot of inspiration from this project and from the talk that I'm giving today from one of my great colleagues in the history department who just retired a year ago. Uh, this was Professor Jan de Vries, who uh, in my eyes, and I think in those of many others, is probably the greatest economic historian uh, of the past generation or so. And Jan de Vries has helped me out a lot here because he wrote a book that relates to this subject that spells out a lot of the how that I've just been talking about. This book is called The Industrious Revolution. It came out about a decade ago. And it shows the patterns, the behaviors by which the levels of demand and the levels of production to meet that demand grew at the household level in Western Europe and in North America. He focused very much on the level of the family that I've already been talking about, the ordinary farming family or in a city, an artisan family where the, they're engaged in the production of some kind of goods, saddles or shoes or metalware or, or whatever, the, the thousand different things. And so Jan has gone ahead and, and explained the how this happened quite well. But that book was not so much concerned with why, and that's what uh, I've been interested in turning to here. And so this is where we're going to begin. 
So on the screen before you, you can see this uh, painting. It's a, uh, a well-known painting from a famous Dutch artist, Peter Bruegel, actually <laughs> Flemish, I guess you would say, of the 16th century, painted right around the time that this thing I'm calling the consumer revolution is starting to take off. And Peter Bruegel actually painted a series of paintings of this subject of the famous Tower of Babel from the book of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible. And so I've started thinking about, well, why is this? Why is uh, this Dutch artist living in a commercial society in uh, the 17th century so interested in this? And if you start to look at this painting, you'll see there are interesting things going on here. There's, there's industriousness down in front here, as you can see the pr presumably stonemasons who are hard at work producing the big blocks of stone that will, are going into the building of the Tower of Babel and they're being visited by some kind of figure of the nobility, maybe a king, maybe a nobleman who presumably has some kind of authority over the building of this great structure. In the background to the left, you can see that there's some kind of settlement, some kind of city or, or town laid out there. And you can understand why, right? If you're gonna build a huge tower like this, you're gonna need a lot of laborers, and those laborers are gonna to need to be fed and clothed and supplied with equipment of all kinds in order to do the construction. So clearly you have to have some kind of town that's generating all of that stuff for that to happen. And as you can see, it's also located, I don't think the, the book of Genesis says this or not, but Peter Bruegel is imagining that the Tower of Babel is located right at the seaside. Because again, if you're building this huge elaborate you know, in this case, fancily decorated structure too, it might not be the case that everything that you need is right here at hand in the place you happen to live. You may need to do overseas trade in order to get the right kind of workers or the right kinds of equipment or materials or something like that that goes into it. And so you can see Dutch style ships from the 16th century uh, coming into the harbor there. There's docks and everything going on. So uh, what Bruegel is imagining is that the Tower of Babel when it was built by these you know, ancient mythical people, must have really required a great deal of concerted, uh, laborious, productive effort in order to make it happen. And so I'm gonna return to this image a few times in order to explain uh, some important shifts here. Now, one of the things that Jan de Vries book did for me in my further investigation of this was to introduce a concept to me that I was unfamiliar with before. It's a concept that comes not from historian scholarship, but from the world of economics. It was a concept that was invented by a famous University of Chicago econom economist named Gary Becker. He won the Nobel Prize some years back. And thinking in fairly advanced terms about the idea of commodities, a famous term in the use of uh, economics. And what I wanna do here is in a sense talk about changes in some of the terminology about how we talk about our economic lives, the things that we want. And commodities is one of these words. What I'll be getting to in a minute is a discussion of how our understanding in modern times has changed from older versions of it. But I wanna focus in on this one peculiar definition here of something that Gary Becker called Z commodities. I'm curious, has anyone here ever heard of this term? It was brand new to me when I first read about it in DeVries's book, but, but it did some important work for me. We all have some idea of what commodities are things on one level, right? If you go to, I grew up in Chicago, and so Chicago was famous for its commodities market. And what that meant was agricultural products. You know, this year's, you know, winter wheat is a commodity that sells at this price, and tomorrow the price will be different. And, you know, there are all kinds of different things. But commodities in general tend to refer to consumer goods, whether the consumer be an individual or a corporation or an industry. But what are Z commodities? Well, Gary Becker invented this term Z commodities to use the word Z to mean last or ultimate. And he doesn't mean just ordinary commodities like uh, you know, winter wheat or microchips or anything like that. What he was trying to define by that term was 
the top of the consumer experience. What is it that consumers in our modern society really want? As I've just said, ultimate commodities. So here's the equation that he came up with. And I think that pretty much explains everything for you. So I'm done now and I'm just gonna go off and leave. And so, uh, no, uh, it's mysterious, right? Well, here, here's what these things mean. Z is the Z commodity. X are purchased goods. So you go to the grocery store tomorrow and let's say you buy um, flour and butter and sugar and coffee beans and tea and uh, you know, a dozen other things. Those are commodities, but you don't go home, open the bag of flour, get out a spoon and start shoveling it in, right? You don't, a lot of the commodities that we buy are not exactly the thing that we consume, right? You, you have to do things to them, right? And so, Part of the equation that creates the Z commodity is the purchased good. But part of it is this other thing called T. And T is a lot more complicated than the bag of flour or the, the jar of coffee beans. T is the time that you spent on labor to acquire goods. So you work at your job, your paycheck comes, now you have money, now you can go to the store and buy the coffee beans and the flour. So that's part of the time. But that's not all of it, right? Because you don't open the bag of flour and just start eating or just eat the coffee beans. You also have to spend time to work to transform the goods, right? So you make the flour into bread. You grind up the coffee beans, you put them in your, your machine, you pour the water in, you press the button, and finally coffee comes out. And in order really to appreciate the ultimate consumer experience, you actually need time to enjoy them or to consume them, right? You don't just, well, maybe some of you, I don't know, but you don't just inject the coffee into your veins and off you go, right? I mean, ideally, here, look at me. I've got one of them right now. A nice cappuccino from the thing over there. Ideally, I would not be drinking this while I was working, while I was giving a lecture, but, you know, sitting at my desk with my feet up and appreciating the, ah, right? You know, I'm going to have a little bit now, as a matter of fact. Mm, that's good, right? See, you want that, right? So what a Z commodity is, is not just the butter or the sugar or the flour. It's the whole experience, right? Your kid has a birthday. Sure, you could go down to the supermarket, buy a supermarket cake, take it home and say, here, kid, and walk off, right? But that's not really what your kid wants. I mean, yeah, they want the birthday cake, but they want you and your family and their friends going around saying happy birthday, you know. They want the whole experience, right? And so even if you could say, yeah, birthday cakes are commodities produced by Safeway, they're not the ultimate commodities, right? And, in, and so in order to produce the things we really want in our society, it always requires a function, as he says here, of purchased goods, and the time spent in these various ways to acquire them, to process them, and to enjoy them. And he said, Gary Becker says this interesting thing, that Z commodities, the things we really want, the things that we think make us happy, are inherently non-traded. You can't just say to your kid, eh, just go have a birthday party over at our neighbor's house, right? Well, here, here's 20 bucks. Go and see if our neighbors can, can, can have a birthday party for you, right? It doesn't work, right? That, that's not the birthday party experience that your child wants. They want your, their birthday with you, right? You can't just, you couldn't hire birthday celebrants to come in and say, okay, Billy, you know, these strangers are going to have the birthday party for you, right? The, the, you, the, Z, come on, the ultimate things that we want are things that have, through the labor put into them, been lifted into a category that you can't actually swap them. They're unmarketable, which is weird for commodities, right? Because commodities begin at this point of things that you can trade. Right? You buy a bag of flour at the Safeway, it's the same as the bag of flour at the Whole Foods, although the Whole Foods one will cost more, of course. Um, but right, so commodities are to some extent thought to be things that, oh, of course you can buy them. But the idea of the Z commodity 
is in the end, because of T, inherently non-traded. And so what I'm trying to get at is where does our modern idea of the Z commodity come from? Well, this is where the Tower of Babel comes in. We can understand that there are certain things, material goods, consumer items, if you want to call them that, that human beings have always needed. Animals need them too, right? Food, shelter from the most violent weather. For human beings, this has always involved houses of various kinds. Clothing, too, is a pretty universal human commodity. And those are sort of immediate goods that we need almost unthinkingly. But a Z commodity, something much more complex than that, is a harder thing to identify. And so this is why I want to think about the Tower of Babel as an example, a mythical example, of course, of history's first Z commodity. So what I've done here is gone to the book of Genesis in the Bible and looked up the verses where the story of the Tower of Babel is first told. And I'm actually giving it to you in the translation of the Geneva Bible, which was done by English Protestants who had to flee from England in the 1550s when Queen Mary was the queen uh, and she was a Roman Catholic bent on persecuting Protestants. So they went over to Europe, they went over to Geneva, they translated a Bible into English and brought it back to England. And they're doing this at almost exactly the same time that Peter Bruegel painted that portrait of the Tower of Babel. So in other words, this translation's version of the Tower of Babel story is essentially the one that's present at the time that Peter Bruegel is painting. And so here, here's the verse. And they, the household of Nimrod, the descendants of Noah, in other words, the, the human beings who had proliferated after the supposed great flood, the descendants of Noah and his wife, the only survivors of that flood, they eventually reach the point where they say to one another, come, let us make brick and burn it in the fire. So they had brick for stone and slime had they instead of mortar. Now this part I don't understand at all, why, why they didn't have mortar and why slime works, but okay. Uh, they may have gotten it at Home Depot, I don't know. Um, so they're planning to build something big. And also they said, and this is the quotation, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto the heavens that we may get us a name lest we be scattered upon the whole earth. Now, who knows, there may have been Z commodities before this, but the Bible doesn't tell us about it. So I picked up on this because this is the first thing you get in the Hebrew scriptures that's talking about people wanting something that goes way beyond ordinary, you know, human need, food, shelter, clothing kind of stuff. All right, there are earlier references to that kind of thing, including the apple eating that got them into a good deal of trouble. But this is the first time anywhere where there's a mention of any kind of human desire for something beyond that. And what is it that they want? A city, a tower, top may reach into the heavens, some kind of elevation, right? Getting up above this sort of earthly domain, up towards something higher, that we may get a name, right? Some kind of reputation, something, ooh, those people, oh yeah, oh right, oh those are the Tower of Babel people, right? Fame, glory, honor, something that elevates them in that sense in the eyes of other people. And finally, lest we be scattered upon the whole earth. So in other words, a spot, a place, some kind of location that concentrates this sense of refinement, identity, whatever. Because the alternative is just kind of humble human beings scattered over the world with nothing connecting them, linking them, or anything like that. Whereas what the Tower of Babel promises is elevation, reputation, and a center to it. Think of a kid having a birthday party, right? At home, being honored by the family, that kind of feeling. Now, in order to understand the shift, 
I want to focus quite specifically on how from before this consumer revolution that I was talking about to afterwards, people thought differently about some of the basic terms of economic life. And so one of these is commodity. I've, I've, I've spent some time now talking about Z commodities and how those are uh, products of this way of thinking about goods that are particularly uh, refined. But I, I'm going to use some uh, Oxford English Dictionary definitions, these historical dictionaries that define how words were used at different times in the past to get at this. So here's the pre-modern way in which English speakers who used the word commodity meant what they meant by this term. What commodity meant before, say, 1600 was a quality or condition of things in relation to the desires or needs of men. The quality of being commodious, convenient, suitable, fitting utility. In other words, something was a commodity if it was comfortable, if it was useful. You know, a nice pillow on your bed, a nice warm uh, fire in your, uh, in your sitting room so that you wouldn't be freezing in the winter. It didn't necessarily adhere to the idea of, of consumer goods, of things that you bought and sold. But by, uh, and for, here's an example, a quotation. Uh, the Vulcan, the Greek god, who was the first that found out the commodity of fire. Now that's interesting, right? Because for us, it would be very weird to call fire a commodity. It's hard to buy and sell fire, right? It's not something that you can store on the shelves of a, a supermarket very readily. This was uh, a sentence by George Sands, one of the colonists of Virginia early in the 17th century. Now, a modern definition comes not very much later, by around the year 1700, in the words of the famous uh, English philosopher, John Locke. The modern definition is a kind of thing produced for use or sale, an article of convenience, I'm sorry, of commerce, an object of trade, uh, goods, merchandise, wares. This is our familiar use of the word, and you can see John Locke is already using it in the 1690s. Consum commodities are movables, valuable by, valued by money things that you can move around and buy and sell. So in just this 80 years or so between the two of these definitions, some kind of shift is happening in terms of what people think when they use that word. <laughs> Here's an example of, uh, this will be on the test, you're gonna need to memorize this, uh, of modern commodity making. This is the pattern of how a flour mill in the 19th century in the United States, all of the steps it had to go through in order to produce modern commodities, which were different grades of flour, patent flour or uh, baker's flour or low grade flour, different things sold at different places, prices. So that's the very modern definition of, of a commodity. How about consumer? The idea, I mean, this kind of drives me crazy, but you know, when politicians or uh, business leaders talk about citizens today, they're almost as likely to call us consumers as anything else. And, and uh, uh, let me go through a couple of the definitions of this. A pre-modern definition of a consumer was a person who or a thing which devours, wastes, or destroys, a person who or a thing which consumes food or drink. Now that's familiar enough, but there was a real emphasis the, of consume being a word that was highly destructive. Uh, this is from John Winthrop, who was one of the founders of Massachusetts Bay, its first governor. And he wrote in a famous speech about what would happen if Massachusetts messed up we shall shame the faces of many of God's worthy servants and cause their prayers to be turned into curses upon us till we be consumed out of the good land whither we are going, right? Until we're eaten up and destroyed, right? That is not a very positive use of the word consumer, but there it is in 1630. And again, if we move forward, the modern definition changes quite a lot. The modern definition is a person who uses up a commodity, a purchaser of goods or services, a customer frequently opposed to producer. And again, John Locke, only 60 years after John Winthrop in 1692, is using the word consume or consumer in a very modern way. Money may be considered as in the hands of consumers, under which name I here reckon the merchant who buys a commodity when made to export. So you see what's happened here? He's calling a merchant a consumer. A merchant buys a commodity, puts it in his ship, 
and sends it somewhere else to sell. The merchant isn't consuming in the traditional sense. He's not eating the flour. He's not, you know, taking it in personally into his body and, and using it up in that sense. He's a consumer in a very refined way of someone who says, I'm buying your stuff here. I'm selling it over there. I'm for a moment the consumer, right? So again, there's a big shift in a very short period of time about how people are thinking about this economic word too. Here are a couple of examples. <laughs> On the left, this was what a pre-modern consumer was. This is the great beast Moloch in the Fritz Lang silent movie from the 1920s called Metropolis. It's consuming you know, human sacrificial victims that are being thrown into the burning maw of the monster. That's pre-modern consumption at its most, right? Here's the modern consumer. Come on, there we go. I'm sure you've probably seen ads like this in glossy magazines and newspapers. The, the thing, the consumer item here is this fancy expensive watch, right? But here it's a little bit like that merchant I just described. I don't know how well you can read the text, but it's saying all of this kind of stuff like, you don't really own this kind of fancy watch. You simply are the custodian for it for the next generation. You know, it's the watch almost owns you because it's so refined and high class. So, you know, the idea is you buy this kind of watch not because you're gonna eat it up, not because you use up a watch every year, but rather, no, it makes you a different kind of person. It makes you into the sort of aristocratic father. I think the son is working out how much they're gonna to have to sell his siblings for in order to pay for the watch, but uh, you, you see what I mean? It's a different kind of consumer altogether. And, and honestly, I've been, how many of you have been watching the NBA finals with the Warriors recently? I look at the advertising of that and half the time, I don't even know what they're trying to sell me. You know, you see all the spiff, fiv, cars, chasing, whatever, and in the end, it's, who knows, it's, I don't know, deodorant or something, but it's, right? It's like, it, it, it's, we're so far from a sense of the direct, you need food, here's good food, kind of approach to commodities into this, you know, you watch the ad, you buy the thing, and then you'll suddenly be like LeBron James or something. I, I, I don't, you know, but that's sort of how we've been conditioned to think. That's kind of what I mean by a Z commodity, right? It's not the Pepsi, it's not the deodorant, it's the belief that if you buy this and use it the right way, you will too be like Steph Curry, right? And of course, that's never gonna happen, but they're selling me that belief. Even the word economy itself has shifted dramatically as a course of this, right? Pre-modern, the word economy it literally comes from the Greek, and in Greek it means household management. And so the word was used to mean the way in which something is managed, the management of resources. And these are pre-modern, again, these are from the time of Bruegel, quotations about it. The economy, the order in doing or dispensation of God, a part whereof is economia, commonly called house rule. So it really involved how you manage the affairs of your life generally. Whereas we now think of it quite explicitly about things like the GDP, you know, and, and, and whether, the, whether the production and sale and purchase and consumption of goods is growing or not. And so that's how we get this modern definition, the organization or condition of a community or nation with respect to economic factors, the production and consumption of goods. Uh, and here is one of my favorite quotations from modern times using this word in exactly this way. This is from the famous economic philosopher, Bruce Springsteen, who uh, used the phrase, but lately there ain't been much work on account of the economy, right? And we all know what he means. That's from The River, a uh, big album from my youth. Um, and you can just say that and know that you mean this complex process of buying and selling and producing and consuming and that sort of thing that somehow has everything to do with whether you get laid off from your job or not, right? Again, it's a far remove from this older sense of economy. So what happened? That, that's the thing I'm trying to explain in, in this project that I'm working on. We kind of know what happened, but why did it happen? Well, for this, I wanna go back to the Bible, to that first Z commodity and think about what it is instructing us to think about if we wanna solve this puzzle. So you probably all know the story. The whole Tower of Babel thing did not go so well, right? It was a big plan, they had it all worked up, and then God intervenes. The Lord came down 
to see the city and tower which the sons of men builded. And the Lord said, behold, the people is one and they all have one language and this they begin to do, neither can they now be stopped from whatsoever they have imagined to do. In other words, the people are getting uppity above themselves. So he says, come on, let us go. I'm not sure who he was talking to there, but uh, come on, let us go down and there confound their language that everyone perceive not another's speech. And so God ruins this whole Tower of Babel project, this refinement and uplifting and concentrating thing by messing with their language, making sure that people can't understand each other anymore and then scattering them upon the earth. So the Lord scattered them from thence upon all the earth and they left off to build the city. Therefore, the name of it was called Babel because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth from that, for thence then did the Lord scatter them upon it. So in other words, God steps in and says, enough of that. I'm going to make things be exactly the way you didn't want them to be. I'm going to make you not able to comprehend each other. I'm going to scatter you across the globe and therefore destroy any capacity of this kind of grand tower building thing that you so much wanted. Now, I, I'm obviously not going to get into the rest of the biblical story about how people respond to that sort of thing. Things don't go so well for the Tower of Babel. But what I will say, and this is where my inclination for how to solve this problem comes from. I will say that somewhere around the time at which Columbus and his successors encountered America, and also around the time in which the reformations of Western Christianity began in the 16th century, there has been a concerted in effort in and focused in Western Europe and then in the Americas to go back and rebuild that tower, to unscatter people, to concentrate labor, and to build some kind of definition of the refinement, the elevation, and, and, and the, the placing of humanity. In a literal sense, you can understand human history from the time in which human beings first evolved in Africa. Here I'm setting aside biblical stuff and talking about what we actually know. The movement of humans out of Africa into Europe and Asia and eventually all over the globe Thousands and thousands of years of scattering literally took place. And then since about 1492, from about the time of Columbus, the past 500 years has been a very short concentrated time of people coming back together again. In other words, the most, if you ask me as a historian, what's the most signal development of the past half millennium? It's that, that with the European contact with the Americas, which were unknown to them, and with global navigation, the most important story in human history has been the recontacting of all people back together again, right? And this is in the news all the time now, the phrase globalization gets kicked around to the point that I'm not sure everyone even knows what it means, but it's been a hugely important development so that now, even if you don't know anyone personally, you can easily find out about all kinds of people on every continent on the globe you know, you can know what they're eating in Indonesia and Brazil. Uh, you can find, you can go on your phone, right? And find menus of a restaurant that someone today is having in Cambodia, right? It's, it's, it's an extraordinary pulling together of the world in a way that is very reminiscent of that Tower of Babel impulse. And one of the most important things that has made that possible has been the industrialization project the thing that Adam Smith famously talked about in his book, The Wealth of Nations of 1776. The thing that he pinpointed that helped make that possible was what he called the great improvement in the productive powers of labor. The greater part of the skill, dexterity, and judgment with which it's anywhere directed or applied, it seems to have been affected or have been the effects of the division of labor. What did he mean by that? Well, he meant the development of what we know of as the factory system, right? So that instead of uh, a single artisan, let's say a shoemaker, a cobbler sitting down and, and making the sole and making the uppers and sewing them together all by himself, first the left shoe, then the right shoe, it's divided. 
right? And so it's done in a factory, and a factory run by one person stamps out the soles, and maybe a factory across town stamps out the uppers, and there's a whole separate shoelace factory, right? And it's the division of labor that makes it possible instead of to do these one at a time by the thousands and the millions. Now that's been a really important development, right? And in a sense, even that painting of the Tower of Babel was foreshadowing some of that stuff as early as the 1560s, the way I showed you. But the interesting thing, and Adam Smith talks about this as well, the interesting thing is that it also happens even in the world of intellectual life. So a professor here like me, or like the one who will speak later this afternoon, isn't just an all around general purpose scholar. I work in history, the person later is in the College of Natural Resources, they're chemists, they're biologists, they're economists, they're linguists, there's everything, right? The division of labor has extended down into the world of what you might generally call learning or philosophy. And that's been great in many ways. It means the economists do incredibly refined things and so do the historians and the chemists and everybody else. But it has come at a certain price. Adam Smith talks about this. I won't go through all the details of this. Each individual becomes more expert in his own peculiar branch. More work is done upon the whole, and the quantity of science is considerably increased by it. I swear to God, that's true. But it also serves the function of dividing us from each other, right? So I began this talk by saying, oh, because I had a colleague who was an economic historian, he knew this term from economics that he introduced to me and made it very interesting to what I wanted to find out. But that was kind of a coincidence. Nothing in my actual training as a historian was geared towards pointing me toward these economists' terms with all of their equations and all, and part of me sort of you know, sees an equation like that and says, no, thank you, that's not how I usually do business. But in this case, it was like, oh, actually, I need this. Right? This way of thinking about it is important to me as a historian. Sorry about that. Um, and so the last move I'm gonna make today to finish this story is this, that the division of scholarship into these little compartments has been in a way a little bit like that Tower of Babel scattering, you know, separating us from each other so we don't speak the same language anymore. And it's literally the case. If I try to go read most of the papers that economists write, they're filled with these kinds of equations and technical terms and that sort of thing that I'm not gonna get. And so one of the things that I think we need to do to solve some of these big, big problems that we face today, like the problem of too much, is to start bringing these things back together again. So even though I am a historian, my answer to this question why do we want what we want? Where does this overweening, growing desire come from? I say we can understand it with the tools of economics, but to really comprehend it, we have to go into yet another academic subject, and that is the world of religion. Because of the hunch that I'm building on is that this transformation in desire that hits Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries happens at the same time that in religious terms, all of European civilization goes through an extraordinary set of upheavals that are often referred to as the Reformation, that is the Protestant opposition to the Roman Catholic Church, but it equally happens in the Roman Catholic Church because the Roman Catholic Church responds to the Protestant Reformation with their own changes. Now you may be looking at me as if I'm a crazy person here and I, I wouldn't blame you that if you did, but I'm, I'm skipping by these things because um, I've just kind of <laughs> gone over them myself. Uh, but I have detected in much of the religious writing of the era of the Reformation, something that I think is an important clue to understanding how human desires, how human wants changed. And for this, I wanna go back to the Tower of Babel one last time. So this was the first version of this painting that, that I put up, Peter Bruegel's, I'm sorry, nope, I, I've made a mistake. This, this is, this is a, a, a different, like I said, he went through a lot of iterations of this. This is a slightly different one. He liked this subject. And I wanna focus in on a little detail. 
This is from the very front and center of the painting on the screen. Oh, it's down here, it's hard to see. But at the foot of this huge tower is this little farmhouse. And the farmers in their, you know, they have a little fence where they're presumably growing some vegetables and things. There's some farmers carrying around bags of food or something that presumably the workers on the tower need. Oops. Uh, and then there's chickens, right? And the chickens are the key to all of this, right? Believe it or not. The little things. The chickens, too, are presumably part of the production of the food. But they're small. They're, they seem meager. When you use a phrase like chicken feed, what do you mean? You mean like nothing, like, like, like little, like, like the lowest level of detail. But chicken feed is really important here. I work on colonial Boston, colonial New England, so I read a lot of documents from there. And one of the documents from it is this tremendous diary of a very religious man, a Puritan, who was also a merchant and a judge and all kinds of things. And as a child of the Reformation, he was tremendously concerned with saving his own soul and learning to love God and become the kind of person who would be saved. And he wrote this in his diary one day. He wrote, while feeding his chickens one January morning, he observed how well they thrived on very mean food which much affected me and convinced me what need I stood in of spiritual food and that I should not nauseate daily duties of prayer, etc. Now this may seem like a very small thing and it was a small thing in a lot of ways, but what is he talking about here? Well, you've probably heard the phrase from the Protestant Reformation that Martin Luther used. Martin Luther was opposed to the priestly orders of the Catholic Church. He didn't like the hierarchy of it. He didn't like the idea that the Roman Catholic priests performed all the ceremonies themselves and the people just looked on and watched. He believed that everybody, every Christian, every person who was a member of these societies ought to be full participants in religious life. And the phrase that he used was the priesthood of all believers. That is, the world shouldn't be divided between priests, the holy people, and then all of the ordinary, you know, bummy folks like you and me, but rather everybody should strive to be priest-like. And the Protestant Reformation was very much about that impulse to make religion something that wasn't just held in the hands of a small number of people who were drawn to that sort of thing, but for everybody. And the Protestant Reformation worked this way. And so this guy st standing in his backyard in Boston, feeding his chickens, is thinking about this. He's thinking about, you know, I hate going to church. I don't particularly enjoy it. I, I find the daily duties of prayer nauseating, as he says here. And that's the problem. My desires, my wants are wrong. What I need to do is learn to like that stuff. I need to learn to want that stuff. I need to want to be more priest-like. I need to internalize that kind of religious desire. So he's looking at his chickens and he thinks, I'm feeding them this crap, but they seem to like it, right? And that's what I need to become. I need to change my sense of self. I need to change what I want. And how is that gonna happen? Well, we all work in universities, right? We know how this is supposed to happen. You learn it by education. Yes, our desires for food and clothing and shelter are pretty natural, that comes by us easily. But our desires for more complicated things, for Z commodities, you have to learn that, right? Little Billy wants a birthday party in part because he's seen his older sister and his older brother have them and because he's gone to a dozen other ones and other houses around for his friends at school and because we live in a culture that does things like produce birthday songs and balloons and a thousand other things, de cake decorating things and party costumes and hats and all that kind of stuff. It's overdetermined that a five-year-old child in our society is gonna want a birthday party, right? They would have had to like, work to avoid learning about birthday parties, right? You're not born wanting birthday parties. You learn how to want them. And you learn how to want them by the experiences you're surrounded by and by the goods that you're surrounded by. The things themselves teach us how to want them. 
And so the argument that I'm making, I'm gonna stop here because uh, I've, I've gone on for too long. But the argument that I'm making here is that we want what we want. We have become a society of consumers demanding more and more things because of events that happened in the 16th and 17th centuries that began in religious terms, that began out of the desire to take an aspect of human spiritual experience that on the whole had been confined to a rarefied class of people, the priests, you know, the bishops, the archbishops, the cardinals, etc., a very tiny segment of society, and a Reformation movement that started to argue, no, everybody should have these things. Does it, did everyone want those things? Certainly not at first, but the educational movements, the instructions led people into thinking about how to change themselves, how to make themselves better in some way, how to elevate their desires. And so this is what I'm exploring in this project. Do I have all the answers yet? No. Might I be wrong? Yes. Right? One of the great things about historical or any other kind of scholarship that a university like this sponsors is that it encourages us, encourages us to ask questions and come up with hypotheses that might not be true. Right? So it's possible I will be on the wrong track, on a dead end here. But what I'm going to investigate now is this question of how the religious reformations projects to change people's desires to start to say, you know, it's not any longer good enough for just a rarefied few people to be priest-like, but now we need to teach everybody how to want different things and why they need to want them. I'm now beginning the project of investigating how that spills over into material goods in other ways. I think the connection is direct because all of the things that it took to teach people, the educational tools involved material goods as well, books, clothing, how you carried yourself, how you dressed, how you behaved around other people. Priests, yes, they worship God, but they also don't spit on the floor. You know, they also act like gentlemen, right? And so part of becoming more godly, this was a term they used at the time, involved learning how to reform your behavior in ways that you weren't just a scruffy farmer anymore, but you acted like a gentleman even if you didn't have a gentleman's status. Right. So that's my big story today. If you're going to ask, why do we want what we want now? Why do we live in a consumer society of the sort that, to go back a little bit, somehow makes us think that if we, where's our, our famous watch ad? Uh, if we buy the right kind of watch, that somehow we will be something that we aren't yet. I mean, my $25 watch tells time well enough for me, just as much as what that you know, $20,000 one was. So why doesn't this do? I don't know. But this idea that somehow our things will make us different and better, I see rooted in the reformations of the 16th and 17th century. And so that's my answer for you today. The end. Thank you.